welcome everyone along to the coaching corner this week. Um, once again, I want to acknowledge our supporters. Phillips has been kind enough to support us with uh, equipment and to uh, allow for the coaching corner to happen. Now, the other thing I just wanted to mention to everyone is that um, we're going to change it up a bit. So. Um, after this evening session, we're going to move to a once a month kind of format. And we're going to go with the first Thursday in the month at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time in Australia. Uh, so I thought we were going to just quickly talk to Kian about his new paper, but Bub's not uh, cooperating tonight and needs dad's attention. So um, I will then have a look at, uh, following on from last week, um, we looked at how to approach the early pregnancy scan and sort of ran out of time before we could get into the detail of what the measurement technique was. So I thought we'd run through, run through some of the um, specifics of measurement technique in early pregnancy. So once you get into the, um, once you get into the scan and you establish viability, the first thing you often want to have a look at is just confirming that viability and measuring the fetal heart rate. There we are. So, um, first of all, we, well, we measure the fetal heart rate with the M mode. And the M mode is defined as a time motion display of the ultrasound wave along a specific line. It provides a monodimensional view of the structure being examined. So all the reflectors along that line are displayed on the time axis. Now the advantage of M mode is that it's got a really high sampling rate. So we get really high time resolution. So that even rapid movement such as the fetal heart can be recorded, displayed and measured very accurately. The disadvantage with M mode is that uh, the M line sort of comes from the middle of the transducer and you can't move that at all. Uh, so what that means for our scanning is that we need to put the object of interest in the center of the picture so that we can get a um, good reflection from the structure of interest and then get the best resolution that we can. And the way that it works is you pop your M, M cursor down and essentially those structures along that M line are represented like this. So in this M, um, this motion trace here, you can see that this black here represents the fluid in the gestational sac. This band of tissue here represents the fetus, a little bit more fluid here in the gestational sac. And then this part at the back here is the uterine wall. Sometimes we look at an M-mode trace and it looks like we've got two heartbeats. Uh, so you can see the heartbeat here and then there's another heartbeat down the bottom here. And essentially what we're seeing in this image at this level on this band of tissue is the fetal heart trace. And then this other heart trace down the bottom uh, is probably reflecting the blood flow or the pulse in the uh, one of the uterine arteries. So that's the maternal fetal, uh, the maternal uh, heartbeat down the bottom here. Now to get a good M mode measurement you need to do a couple of things and I've boiled it down to three simple steps. The first step you need to do is to optimize your B mode image. If you don't have a really good B mode image then any of the trace you do is not going to be the best. So first of all we want to locate the fetal heart and adjust the depth and focus so that that picture is optimized and we've got baby looking as big as it, as it can be and then we're going to apply the zoom so you should only zoom the image after you've optimized it so that you can get a good quality zoom image the next step is to activate the m mode trace so you push the m button and most of the time that means that the trace would automatically start. On some systems you might need to position the M mode and then activate the trace or update the trace. So what you want to do is once you've activated the trace is just allow enough time for the trace to record and to get your fetal heartbeats and then push the freeze button. Then step number three is to measure and record. And the first thing you'll need to do because you're in an obstetric uh, preset 
you need to choose the calculations package and tell the machine that you want to measure a fetal heart rate because it's not psychic. So it, it doesn't know what you're measuring. So you need to tell it, I want to measure a fetal heart rate. And then that will prompt the cursors to come up. You position your first cursor, set the position, position the second cursor, and then that should theoretically spit out a fetal heart trace. Uh, now, just check on your machine. Some systems will calculate the fetal heart rate over one heart cycle, some machines over two. I've even used a machine that calculated over three heart cycles. So often it will prompt on the, on the screen somewhere um, how many heart cycles are required to get the right heartbeat. If the fetal heart trace is looking like it's beating at the right rate and then you've uh, got a heart rate that is you know, 300 or it's only 80, chances are you're measuring over one or three or whatever it might be. You're not measuring over the right number of um, heart cycles. So just, just be careful that you've got the right number of heart cycles to measure on. So here's an example. We've got seven week or so gestation here. Now this is once we've optimised the image. So you can see on this one, we've zoomed up the image already and we've got the feet is looking as big as we can. We then position our end mode cursor so that it intersects and goes right through the heart. And then that, and then we activate the end mode and we'll get an end mode trace. And once we've got enough beats there, we need to freeze the image. Our next step is to go to the calx packet package. So push the calx button, choose the fetal heart rate, and then that will prompt the cursors and you position your cursors at two heart cycles. It doesn't matter if it's a peak or a trough, as long as you're positioning your cursors where the repetitive pattern is. Don't forget to save your measurement so that it goes through and records on the reports page. Or save your image. Saving your image um, can achieve the same thing. So here I've got an example of, this is a seven week gestation, and we have the depth set here at 20 centimetres. And you can see over here, there's a whole lot of silicate down the bottom that is a waste of space, really. Um, we've just got black, there's not so much going on. And we're using a, half of our monitor is being wasted because we haven't set our depth correctly. The resulting trace, um, so usually you, set your, you bring your depth up first, you change your depth and optimize the depth. Then you apply your zoom and then zoom it so that you get a really blown up image of the, of the, jet, of the fetus and then activate the M-mode trace. If we look at this one with the depth set at 20, you can see where this yellow line is here. Uh, that's where the fetal heart trace is. All of this bit is wasted space, wasted space. If I optimize my image now and bring the depth up to about 10 centimeters and then zoom, you can see the resulting um, fetal heart trace here is much easier to see and it's much easier to be able to position your cursors on this trace here versus the trace over here. So that's with the depth set at 10 centimetres and we've applied the zoom. So it's really important, those three steps again, is to optimise the B mode image, activate the M mode trace and then perform your calculations. The next step we need to do in, in measuring things in early pregnancy is dating. Now, I always encourage people to start with to scan and just have a look at the gestation. What anatomical structures can you see? And if you know a little bit about the sonoembryology and the, and the developing fetus, you can start to make a broad sort of, well, this pregnancy is in the six to eight week zone or it's in the 10 to 12 week zone simply because you recognize what structures have developed at that time. A six week gestation looks very, very different to a 12 week gestation. So we can kind of guesstimate it to start with before we start measuring. And the reason that, that I suggest that you do that is often what I see as a common mistake is that people will, um, will measure, it might be a 10 week gestation, but they do a poor crown rump length measurement and it makes it look like it's eight weeks or it measures at eight weeks and that doesn't correspond with the anatomy that we're seeing. So if we refresh what our anatomy is at four weeks or they've just missed their last period, you've got a nice thick endometrium and you can't see anything in it. 
By the time we get to five weeks after the last period, you can see a space in the uterus. And if you're lucky, this is a transabdominal picture, you might at five and a half weeks, you'll see that yolk sac. At six weeks, it's just a little blip. And then it gets a little bit longer blip at seven weeks. And then by the time we get to eight weeks, I reckon this looks like a little Lego brick or some people have described like a little gummy bear appearance. So you can start to see the little buttons here or the little limb buds, there's a little knob sort of on the edge. By the time we get to nine weeks, you start to be able to tell that one end of this blip is a head and there's looking like the head structures and the other end looking a bit more pointy like the crown are the rump structures. So by the time we get to nine weeks, the head is actually half of the embryo at that stage. 10 weeks represents the end of the embryological period. And then we move into the fetal period. So by the time we get to 10 weeks, all the structures are in place and they need to grow. If you look at the baby here, it's quite see-through. The bone, bones might be there, but they're quite see-through and they're not very ossified at this stage. 11 weeks, we start to see a little bit of bone formation, particularly in the face. And that's much, much more obvious at the 12 week mark where we can see ossification of the jaws and then we can also start to notice the different um, bones in the legs, etc. In early pregnancy, uh, we measure the mean sac diameter, or we're measuring the gestational sac. Now, the way you go about performing this is in the sagittal view of the uterus, you measure the length of the gestational sac and at right angles to that, the depth. In the transverse view of the uterus, you measure the width of the gestational sac. You don't want to measure the depth on both images because the depth is the same regardless and that means you'll get a skewed uh, result for your images because measuring the depth, whether you're sagittal or transverse on the patient will give you the same result. One of the problems with measuring the gestational sac is that from about eight weeks on, it's pretty, pretty useless really. The, by this stage, the gestational sac occupies about a third of the volume of the uterus and uh, it can be quite misshapen. The gestational sac or the mean sac diameter is the height plus the width plus the depth divided by three. And it only works and gives you a nice measurement that's representative of gestational age when it's nice and round. And we only use the gestational sac measurement um, for that early period where we can't actually see a crown lump length. By the time we get to eight weeks, you can see on this one, it's kind of a bit oblong in shape. And, you know, it depends where I measure. If I measure the depth here or a little bit over here, it's going to give me very different measurements. And I've only got a straight line ruler to measure the length here. I can't really get the length going around corners. Um, and you can see that here as well. It really depends where I put the calipers, what the resulting uh, mean sac diameter will be. So as soon as you see a crown rump length, you couldn't measure gestational sac anymore. The most accurate measurement of, uh, that, that's the best for dating at any stage during pregnancy is the crown rump length. So if we look at the crown rump length now, the fetal pole grows by about a millimetre per day. And what we need to do to measure the crown rump length is to measure the longest straight line length of the embryo without the yolk sac. We need the fetus to be in a neutral position and with clear margins. And if we do a good measurement here, the, the accuracy of the measurement is to within about four days of when the actual last period was or when fertilization happens. I always recommend that people practice measuring the crown rump length to acquire three new images. So get an image, find the crown rump length, and then take a measurement, and then unfreeze and acquire the image again and take a measurement and do that three times. Now there's a couple of reasons. One is to make sure that you have got a nice accurate measurement and that your intra observer error is minimized. And the other reason is to practice actually getting the crown rump length. So the more you practice, the easier it becomes. So if you, if you 
practice getting it and that first one always takes a long time and you're trying to figure out where things are if you unfreeze and practice again hopefully that muscle memory comes and kicks in a little bit quicker and you understand how you've got that image a little quicker and so you get more practice each time when we take the crown rump length we're aiming for a sagittal section of the fetus so the sagittal section divides the fetus into left and right halves it can be lying on its back or lying on its tummy or any which way in, in the tummy, but we're looking to take that measurement in a true sagittal section. We can take it here, but if baby's lying on its side, we get the coronal picture. Now, you know, there are times when I have done a coronal measurement of the, of the crown rump length. I'm always, always, always trying to get the best sagittal picture and for those really, really determined babies that do not want to keep away um, and I just can't get it no matter what I do, that's when I'll accept a coronal. But we don't want to just go straight to a coronal. Now the coronal plane cuts it into front and back halves. So it's harder to kind of identify where the actual rump is in the top of the head uh, on this one, that you've got the actual top of the head. So you can see on this one again, Bob's in a different position, but we want to cut that bab into left and right halves and not into front and back. Now, if I end up getting a picture that is coronal, the probe movement that I need to make, um, well, this is the image that you'll get, first of all. So you can see where the head is. And on this one, this is a transvaginal image. So it's really nice definition. They never looked at um, clear on trans abdominal imaging. If I'm in a coronal plane, if I move the probe around so that I can then approach it from the back or equally as much go around to the front to get a sagittal image of the fetus, then I get a picture looking like this. And that's the, that's the plane that we need to measure the crown rump length in. So just looking at those two again, you know, this one, if I'm desperate, this one's going to certainly give me a gestational age. And, you know, sometimes you can't get perfect. So you want to aim for a sagittal picture. That's the true crown rump length measurement and where it's most accurate. Now, sometimes what happens is that you might see the baby's head and not be able to find its backside quite nicely. So you've got the crown in view, but not the rump. So what you need to do here is to hold the head side of the probe or the right side of the probe in this, in this instance, as it is to the user, and anchor that side and then just pivot on the other end so that you're moving this side of the probe to line it up with the middle. Other times you'll get the back side in view and we'll miss the head. And so it's the opposite movement. Hold the the rump side of the probe still and use it like a pivot or a door hinge. So hold that side of the probe still and pivot the other end of the probe. What you're aiming to do here is not to pivot the probe around the center point of the probe, but hold one end still and swing the other end. You don't know which way is going to work. So I do it one way. If that didn't work, try the other and um, you'll end up by by ruling it out, you'll figure out which way was the correct way to move the probe. Now, if we look at the crown rump length measurement, at, at the six to seven week mark, this is a really tricky time because sometimes the, the yolk sac looks like a round structure that could be the fetal head. We want to make sure that we're not measuring the yolk sac as part of the crown rump length measurement. So the crown Rump length measurement is the pink bit, the yellow bit's the yolk sac, and the measurement should just be of the crown rump length. Let's have a look at seven weeks. So we've got the long blip at eight weeks. Eight week measurement. Now this one's done, uh, taken in a coronal plane rather than in a sagittal plane. Nine weeks, so you can see again, the, the fetal head is about half of the baby at this stage. <clears throat> 10 weeks, now this is transabdominal measurement versus transvaginal. And of course, on the transvaginal, because we're closer to the structures using a high frequency probe, we can start to see the amnion really clearly and the different cystic structures in the brain, which represent the, 
the development of the fetal brain and the different spaces in the fetal brain. So you can see a lot more detail on the transvaginal image. 13 weeks, you can tell that it's quite um, advanced here. We've got jawline, you can see the nose bone. You know, and in an imaging study, they would use this sort of picture to measure the nuchal lucency as well. Um, but we're looking to make sure, especially sort of 10, 11, 12 and 13 weeks, the trick here is making sure that you've got blood in a neutral position, not too flexed and not too extended. And it may be necessary to measure the, uh, the BPD or you know, get a short axis of the head with the falcs in the middle and measuring uh, the width of the baby's head. Um, sometimes you can do fe femur lengths if you're really struggling, if Bob's in a really um, curled up position. But uh, doing bi biometry at this stage, like the BPD, abdocerc, femur length and stuff is often quite tricky. So it's only sort of last resort. So that kind of wraps up all the measurements that you might need to make in the first trimester. Does anyone have any questions? So for sort of average um, ED transabdominal imaging quality, when should we bother checking the crown lump, rump length and believing it, if you know what I mean? Yeah, it's interesting because um, I kind of use these measurements in a couple of ways. You have to have done a lot of scans to have the um, dexterity to be able to get a good crown rump length. So I kind of think the role in, in early pregnancy in the ED is, is it, is, there, is it in the uterus and is it alive? And then if you look at it and kind of go, well, I'm seeing this kind of, um, these kind of limbs or, uh, you know, I think it's eight to 10 weeks. And to get a sort of ballpark figure, um, and the reason I say that is because often, unless you've done heaps, and I'm talking more than 50, 70 cases, the, the probe moves are quite tricky. And then what happens is that a lot of poor measurements are taken. And then, you know, then they have their formal scan, they get three or four different dates, and everyone's confused. And then the imaging department just go, oh, those ED physicians don't know how to do this and all the rest of it. So Strictly in first trimester, I think in the ED, it's about confirming viability and, and kind of going, here's a ballpark at six to eight weeks or eight to 10 weeks. I include the measurements here. If you're doing heaps, if you're in an early pregnancy assessment center and you're doing them regularly and you're developing your skills, you can measure them. Um, I include them also to say, here's what's possible. Here's what's going to happen. The OBS and gynae team need to know how to do them. Depends which, if you're um, doing your qualification and doing the CCPU, the basic early pregnancy doesn't really, doesn't necessarily require that you do crown rump length. But if you did the advanced module, uh, then you're required to do advanced, uh, the crown rump length measurements. But it also, for the advanced module, needs transvaginal scanning as well. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think that it's in the emergency room, it's about confirming viability, making sure it's in the right spot and that there's no free fluid. And, you know, having an idea that it's a six to eight weeks or it's 10 weeks um, to, to sort of give it that ballpark rather than necessarily being 100% accurate with a crown rump length. If you did a crown rump length, it'd be after eight weeks, I think. Because in that, in that early bit, it's really hard to see transabdominally. So the crown rump length sort of comes into play in the emergency room, potentially after that's at the eight weekish mark. So um, the same tips and tricks that you described for the ovaries a couple of weeks ago, you know, like filling, bladder filling, I presume that would make the whole situation easier, especially in T1. Bladder filling in T1, I think, is really important. Well, depending on your patient, if your patient's larger, any sort of bladder filling is going to help. Um, on your average Joe patient, the bladder filling is really quite important up to about that eight or nine week mark. And then after that, 
stage, there's enough fluid around the fetus itself to be able to provide a window. The uterus is bigger as well. And so it now goes past where the edge of the bladder is. And so the bladder is not as helpful. Um, early pregnancy, up to that six to eight week mark, bladder filling is really vital. Yeah, transabdominally. Transvaginally, it's an empty bladder. So it's a completely different ball game. Jono, I, uh, I have a tip for you, if you like. Um, this little fella down here, um, get yourself a handheld and get one of these and uh, scan every week, twice a week, <laughs> and then you become very uh, proficient. That's certainly what we did. And I, was found, I found that uh, um, you're right, Suan, the amount of small movements can make him look so much, so different. But, yeah. but at the end of the second trimester, we kind of got used to how he looked. Yeah, it's, it's I think, out of all the things we teach at ZDU, I think fetal biometry is by far the most difficult. And then coming in second is cardiac windows. Um, the fetal biometry is the most challenging because there's the big probe movements you need to do to actually find where the fetus is. But the difference between the right plane, for example, for a BPD and one that's got a little bit of cerebellum in it that you're not supposed to use is a whisker. And you need really fine tuned motor skills and an understanding of which way to go to be able to do that. And crown rump length, you can get somewhere in the baby, but to get it in the right plane. The other, the other mistake that people make when they're doing these measurements is to just go on the front of the belly and use a window that's about 10 centimeters square. Sometimes you need to be right over on the hip and pointing right back to get a good window and to get the right cut or to get the sagittal section. And unless you're using the whole belly as your window, you're not gonna get all the views that you need. So um, it's another common problem in early pregnancy that, that people kind of stick to wherever they plonk their probe and don't move around enough and don't use the whole gamut or the whole range of movement that you can do to get a good to get a good measurement cool does anyone else have any questions i think Suanne, obviously getting used to uh following a moving target is challenging too isn't it mm. as you'd say and then once you get that, you're often scared to move off to the sides that you need to, to get the full lateral movement because you finally thought, well, I've got something, I'm just gonna take it. So, yeah. I think, I think the challenge in any pregnancy is not only the moving target, um, using the whole range and, and because it's, it's the understanding of the three dimensional anatomy as it turns upside down and rolls around and keeping on top of that um, as you go is the challenge. Lots of practice. Cool. Is there any other questions there? All righty. How's, how's Junior going, Kian? I think he's actually okay for a few minutes. We could try it. We could try. If he gets out of hand, I apologize in advance. Well, that's all right. Well, if he does, we can tackle it maybe next time. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Kian has done a, uh, uh, written a paper, Utility of Lung Ultrasound in COVID, a Systematic Scoping Review. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Kian to introduce himself and where he's working, etc., and what his uh, background is. Over to you, yeah, Thanks, Kian. Um, I'm Kian McDermott and I um, started my ultrasound journey a couple of years ago and a lot of it involved uh, ZDU or your, um, uh, when you were then ultrasound training solutions in Melbourne. So I was working in Bendigo and Geelong and um, started my ultrasound journey with you guys and it was a really great base in some of the common um, modalities in ultrasound. Um, so at the moment, I'm working in Dublin in Ireland in a matter hospital, and I'm helping just develop protocols and training exercises um, for our ED physicians and some very in-house physicians and try, really trying to promote kind of grassroots ultrasound 
and get everybody thinking about scanning um, in the, at the point of care. So, and the, the journey around that interfacing with cardiology, radiology, and um, our training bodies as well is the um, big negotiation, negotiate, negotiating hurdle at the moment, or, or, you know, however you see to look at that. So to try and bring people along and to get them, you know, involved in the practice of scanning. So that's why, that's where I fit into all of this. And so you wrote, uh, you wrote an article hot off the press this week. Um, who mm. were the colleagues that worked with you on this article? So, yeah, so that paper, I was involved in this paper. It was the, I was involved in the review process of this paper. So paper, Mike Trower is a, an emergency doc in uh, Guy's in St. Thomas in London. And I've come to know him over the last couple of months. A lot of us in the UK have, and Ireland have got together kind of over social media, over Slack, because we've all been pushed to the forefront with um, with the need to think differently in COVID times and pandemic times. So I've met a fantastic group of people, and Mike was one of them, as is one of the other co-authors, uh, Nick Mainai. Um, so he's a very enthusiastic uh, trainee in, in Leeds at the moment and uh, is helping drive this as well. One of his quality improvement projects for his fellowship exams has been uh, in ultrasound governance. And then I think everybody has at least heard of or met Bob German at some stage. So Bob is based in um, the northeast of England and really has been driving a university-led uh, module in point-of-care ultrasound. So they're the authors, but Mike Trower was leading out on this. And what motivated you to do this paper? Um, I think there's been a lot published about ultrasound in um, COVID and specifically lung ultrasound in COVID. So we try to bring as much of the evidence together under one roof as possible. So it's a scoping review. So we chose specific articles, ones that are looking at the diagnostic accuracy of lung ultrasound. Uh, it was a kind of a, I, I found over the last three months, and you guys have been amazing at bringing all the evidence together on social media and on the ZDU website, but the traditional literature and the sources that we search just can't keep up to date with them. Um, with pandemic medicine and specifically in the area that we're looking at. So we found it takes so long to get things into, into press or into publication. And by that time, the data that you're writing about two or three months ago has often changed, or that's been the case here. Um, and we found that some of the pre-publication websites like MedArchive or Figshare, which is where this paper sits now, so they're non-peer non reviewed at the moment while they're waiting for publication and um, they're a very useful source of um uh, of um just to disseminate the information so to get the information out there so we really try to bring together all the information that's out there in a scientific sort of way um that was our motivation really did you have any preconceptions of what you're going to find i think we knew what was going to be useful i think and by that lung ultrasound was going to be useful i think we thought it might be more useful than it was initially when we set out we said this is like a, a, a sonographer or a sonologist dream you know you can diagnose a disease ct you can't do it pcr not so accurate maybe you can go up and put a probe in somebody's chest and say yes they have covid no they don't um i think we thought it might be like that but the reality is a bit different i think it depends so much on the prevalence of the disease in the population. Three months ago in Europe, um, the changes that you were seeing were down to COVID and the lung ultrasound uh, findings often correlated. Now, the picture is a lot more muddy because the prevalence is reduced in the population. Um, but I think what we have found is, and something we've discussed lots on, on, on different webinars, is that the if you can do all the basic stuff right, so get some basic um, DBT images, basic lung windows and basic lung uh, sorry, basic cardiac and basic lung images, you're going to get an awful lot more information than individual tests like a chest X-ray or blood tests. You just add a kind of dynamic data point to the whole picture. So it's really useful. And um, who, who are the predominant users of ultrasound for COVID? Is it mostly in the ED or is it across the hospital? Where I work, it's ED and ICU. And that's not surprising really because they're the two uh, places where most of our patients sit so they come in through the ed front door we might get to them in the we have a streaming tent we might get to them in the streaming tent and try and make a decision 
often they're going to an isolation area within the ED and we have to be very careful to avoid that anchoring bias, you know, thinking everyone that's short of breath uh, actually has COVID. So there's lots of different reasons for that and we've all got caught out in the past with that. And then, you know, we decide to the patient either is likely or unlikely and sometimes it's based on long ultrasound findings, sometimes it's blood tests or the clinical picture. And then obviously if the patient deteriorates, they go to the intensive care unit. And I've found that with the group on either end, the well patients or the critically unwell patients, maybe the lung ultrasound portion isn't as useful, but maybe the other portions are like cardiac or vascular ultrasound or procedural parts as well. So. And did, um, were there any common barriers to using ultrasound? Like was, was decontamination the real issue or access and training? I think acceptance and that's, uh, within the hospital base was the main initial barrier. Um, I spent a lot of March and April training, talking to our hospital admin, convincing them to buy more machines, which we, which we got over the line, convincing of the power of the handheld units, um, like some of the Philips devices, and there's other companies out there as well that make pretty much end-to-end -end solutions that are much easier for cleaning. Yeah. I think it was, again, just changing the culture was the main barrier. We thought decontamination might be more of an issue. And I think careful cleaning more than rigorous decontamination is probably the issue. So if you make sure you clean the machine as you should have done all the time along, because it's a, it'll be killed by a virucidal wipe and not just the probe face, um, but to clean an arm's length down to the, the cable and clean the legs and clean the body of the machine as well. Uh, so we thought maybe, you know, you'd have to use something like a high level disinfectant. Um, but no, careful cleaning of it was the, the, the decontamination piece that seems to come out the most. I think everywhere across the world, shopping trolleys and everything is much cleaner than they've ever been in their life. Um, <laughs> did you, um, uh, my bugbear with, log, with lung ultrasound is the is the multitudes of terminology. Um, there's the A's and the B's and the C's and the Z's, and then there's the, mm. the physical description of artifacts, which I'm in favour of. But uh, do you think that this, this muddied the waters and made it harder for acceptance or to understand how to interpret things? That's a tricky question to answer. I mean, I, I'm relatively new to ultrasound for sure, and I... You know, you look at the work of Daniel Lichtenstein in Paris and then Gio Valpicelli in Italy and loads of other people around the world. And they really have taken a non-entity, you know, whereby all the rest of the sonography word were saying, you know, lung can't be evaluated. And they turned, you know, the, this mystical kind of pictures into a science and they've created nomenclature around it. I think it can be complex and I think when new terminology comes out, it's, it's very hard for the new user to try and get their head around that. What's the difference between rockets and glass rockets and beelines and comet tails? I suppose it just reflects the complexity of the terminology, but I think we can, as educators, we can break it down for the new users and then build up bit by bit, layer by layer as people advance on their journey. That's another yeah. art and skill, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Do you, um, while you have identified the, that the methodological quality was low, what general learning do you think can be taken from the COVID experience into lung ultrasound more generally? I think you can, I think to try and get people to understand that, you know, it's a useful thing. You know, when we're teaching it on some of our courses, you say, oh, anterior lung, posterior lung, um, a lines, B lines, pleural effusion, and that tends to be where it stops. Whereas now I think people are really focusing in on the finer aspects to get a look at that pleural line. What does that pleural line really look like? Is it consistent? What do the B lines look like? You know, are they, are they kind of cardiogenic B lines? Are they pulmogenic B lines? And to really f understand that, you know, as much as it is difficult on the front of the chest to get some good parasternal lung axis or apical four images, it can be just as difficult at the back to get in between a rib because the rib changes in orientation and shape every bit along the chest. So I think people kind of thought of lung ultrasound as kind of Cinderella's ugly sister compared to echo. And now they're realizing that it is actually a very high skill set within itself. 
but there are lots of basic um, movements and training phases that you can take to to bring it alive to the new user. So I think people are just realizing how important it is. And especially when you combine it with cardiac, with IVC and some of the other multi-system um, uh, imaging modalities to get a fuller picture. So again, it's kind of what um, uh, Daniel Lichtenstein talks about when he says whole body ultrasound. I think for me, I think the, the getting the pictures for lung ultrasound, the physically you know, physically finding the windows is somewhat easier than pretty much everywhere else in the body, but the interpretation of the images is more complicated. Whereas I think the pattern recognition in other parts of the body is somewhat easier, but the getting the window and getting the view is more difficult. Do you think that lung ultrasound has helped with more broader adoption of of ultrasound in your department or are they using it for other things now as well? It started with lung and then you're moving on or how's it, how does it work in your department? We've been lucky. Um, we have a reasonably good amount of machines and most of my senior colleagues will at some level um, engage with ultrasound and use it to enhance what they do on a daily basis. So I think we started out by using it for lots of different modalities and then lung came along and, you know, like you say, it's the interpretation of it. The, getting the images are not too bad, but then trying to build in that interpretation phase um, made, it, made the adoption of lung ultrasound difficult because it changes then with the prevalence of the disease in the population. So if it's, you know, wintertime here and somebody has a cough and a high temperature, it might be influenza and pneumonitis. Or if it's in a pediatric setting, it might be RSV bronchiolitis, but now it might well be uh, COVID pneumonitis. I think for people to, uh, to accept that, um, that the clinical picture changes with the disease prevalence has been a big um, leap of faith. So I guess we'll finish up with, if you knew in January what you knew now after your big systematic review and seeing lung ultrasound sort of rise to prominence across the ultrasound world, what would you do differently? And, and what do you think people need to focus on as we sort of come towards a new normal after COVID yeah. or you know, post COVID, post pandemic? Um, I think I would really put a lot of my effort into getting the training right. So getting more people up to scale with two or more heart views, um, the ability to scan in the anterior zones, the lateral zones, the posterior zones, um, just getting people up to speed with the basics, I think, really is the key point. And I wish I had uh, foreseen, you know, the big, um, the fact that everybody could do this on Zoom and I was ready to pivot around that. I don't think anyone did, but I think now we're a little bit more comfortable with training online, even having a call like this, making it a reality. Um, it's hard to stay ahead of that curve like that, isn't it? But I think the basics to get them into people, the probe into people's hands more and more and more to do the basics right. I think that's where the high yield is. And then, you know, there is fancy stuff and there is more advanced stuff, but that will come with time. Cool. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, I, I was very interested in your article and I'm interested in the insights and um, thank you so much for sharing them with us. Oh, thank you. And, anyone, uh, big, thanks, anyone... big thanks to this fellow for staying quiet. Yeah, I reckon <laughs> we're lucky. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Ken? So I'm going to then just wrap up today's coaching corner. Thanks so much, Kian, for your input. And uh, thanks everyone on the line for coming along. Um, we'll be taking the coaching corner to a once month format now on the first Thursday of the month, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. And uh, spread the word. Next time we need some questions. So send, shoot us your questions and uh, then we can tackle some of your ideas. Thanks so much for joining us. See you later. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.